Hello, everybody. I'm really glad that you joined today for um, our already fifth uh, session of Open Glam Now, the webinar series on open cultural heritage collections and institutions by digital means. We are going to talk today about play with data, creative reuse and digital experiences. We are going to discuss questions such as how can museums work with their digital open data? How can digital collections enhance the visitor experience in the institution or on its platforms? And how can cultural heritage institutions encourage reuse of their data? And um, as this is an online uh, session, you can always turn to Twitter and use the hashtag OpenGlamNow to um, discuss these topics now or later. Um, and we're going to talk today um, with these three amazing speakers. So, um, first on our uh, virtual stage today is Jane Alexander from the Cleveland Museum of Art. She's the Chief Digital Information Officer at the CMA and she's creating iterative digital products at the museum. She's responsible for the strategy, the content, the design and implementation of interactive digital experiences. And she's also led the CMA's um, comprehensive open access strategy um, with high-res images to reuse, remix and uh, share online. Hello, Jane. Um, next up is Aron Ambrosiani from the Nordic Museum here in Sweden. He's the digital media producer at the Nordic Museum and he's working on digital projects both within and outside the museum building. He's also managing projects from apps and audio guides to exhibition media. Hi Aron. And um, last but obviously not, not least, Marietta Sanderhoff from uh, the National Gallery of Denmark. Um, she's the curator and senior advisor in the field of digital museum um, practice and she's responsible for the museum's open access policy. Um, she works to foster active reuse of the museum's digitized collections and she's also really active on the EU level in the uh, digital heritage field. She was the chair of the European Network Association and she's currently a member of the EU Commission's expert subgroup on digital cultural heritage and Europeana. We're going to start our session today with a presentation from Moretta. Hi Moretta. Okay, first of all, thanks Larissa for um, arranging this webinar series. I think it's amazing and a great learning experience that you can actually meet and um, share knowledge without uh, burning um, uh, CO2. I'd like to just introduce myself a little bit because I love this play with data um, theme uh, and it's been um, a guiding principle for me uh, in working as a curator of digital museum practice to actually uh, take a playful approach uh, to it, like here with the Europeana Network, where we're playing um, uh, Go Yourself uh, at the SMK. Um, the SMK, uh, as you said, is the National Gallery of Denmark. It has a huge collection of a quarter of a million artworks. Uh, two thirds are in the public domain. Uh, so we have very free um, uh, terms to play with it. Um, I've been at the SMK for 12 years and I was a part of writing the first digital strategy where we committed ourselves to become a catalyst of users' creativity. Um, and the um, program that I'm currently working on is called SMK Open, running for five years to open up and tie together SMK's digitized assets um, for all to use and enjoy. So uh, we've already had for a number of years, years free download of images uh, and once we launch our new online collection, actually in two weeks, um, we will have a larger scale and a more comprehensive search function into all of this. We use the public domain uh, dedication from Creative Commons to let uh, our users everywhere in the world know that they have not only permission but right to use um, this cultural commons that we steward um, and in this work um, being these this catalyst of users creativity we see ourselves uh, taking on a new role as facilitators 
in the museum. This is just kind of a graphic visualization of uh, the principle of SMK Open reading from left to right. We start with the CC0 collection uh, encompassing all the different assets uh, that can then be displayed on our website through our API and on external platforms and lead to a ton of fun and uh, inspiring projects that other people uh, create with uh, our open data. And I'm going to bring you through uh, examples of that in my short introduction here today. The idea of opening up um, the collection of the National Gallery of Denmark is um, an attempt to democratize um, in the digital age this collection that we hold. Uh, the museum was made um, what it is today in 1849 when Denmark became a democracy. Before that, the collections belonged to the Danish kings, but in 1849, the the collections were handed over to the Danish public. And today with digitization, we have a new ability to um, add a layer to the democratization. The strategy that we're working from at SMK these years is called SMK for All. And I'll quote a little bit from it. Being the National Gallery and Main Art Museum in Denmark, SMK carries an important responsibility towards the entire country and beyond. The vast collection of 700 years of art is common national property, and ideally everyone who lives in Denmark share a sense of ownership to this unique cultural heritage. Our work is based on the conviction that the artworks in our rich collection has a role to play in the society that surrounds us, through its ability to deepen our understanding of the world, its peoples and histories. So we believe that the development museums have undergone in the past decades holds the key to engage far more and more different people than we reach today. And that development is going from being sort of temples, mu uh, museums as temples where people come to visit in admiration and, and awe of the original artworks, uh, to adding that new layer of also being a partner and a facilitator that helps catalyze uh, the creative abilities of the publics themselves. So the question I ask myself every day when I go to work is how can digitized cultural heritage contribute to meaningful personal experience, relevant new insights and ultimately societal development as we claim in our strategy. So one thing I'd like to start with before I go into examples of creative reuse um, that we have explored lots in uh, the past couple of years is that we have also explored things that didn't really work out. Um, and this picture is sort of the epitome of that. We have done lots of um, screen-based experiments in the galleries uh, to sort of activate people's knowledge seeking and conversations with each other through social media or different online uh, devices. And what we experienced every time was that um, it inhibits people's experience of the original artworks in the galleries when they actually come to visit the museum. So they look down on the screens instead of engaging with the artworks in the galleries and each other, it's also social ambition. So our strategy today and with SMK Open is very much about what can our data do beyond the walls of the physical museum in the physical museum right now, we don't have a lot of screen-based interaction. We try to support people in having social experiences with each other and authentic meetings with the artworks and the artists. Um, I have a graph to sort of pinpoint where we think that um, our digital strategy really uh, is successful. So the classical museum work uh, lay in the enlightenment and physical area, whereas digitization and the experience economy has brought about new opportunities. But what we are learning uh, is that the real inspiration and 
uh, satisfaction is happening when we can work in the crooks of this graph. And I'll show you some examples of that very quickly. One of the places where we succeed in bringing together digital and physical enlightenment and experience is in our monthly wiki labs, where we bring together museum uh, experts, Wikipedians and um, volunteers together to learn how to write Wikipedia articles about art history. Some Danish cultural institutions contribute and uh, share the uh, hosting these events and it has a huge impact in terms of how many people actually encounter our collections online. Another example of uh, bridging the gap from physical uh, to digital and back is uh, that we work with 3D scanning our sculpture collection uh, in very high resolution, also released under this uh, with the CC0 uh, public domain dedication. Uh, we work together with um, Scan the World. Um, uh, like Wikipedia, it's a volunteer um, effort by people around the world uh, who go around with hand scanners uh, and scan in institutions. And the models can then be reused uh, by artists. For instance, um, if you follow this uh, link here, you'll find uh, a video project that has been shown in the museum uh, at an event last year. I have so many examples. This is a jewelry design contest um, where uh, Shapeways um, and SMK partnered inviting their jewelry designers to be inspired by works in uh, the SMK collection. The winner was uh, this wonderful necklace design uh, based on a 1532 Renaissance painting by the German artist Lukas Karnak the Elder. Uh, what we did was then make a small pop-up exhibition at the museum again to bridge the digital and physical and show the winners um, that you could also buy in the shop and do an art talk with the winning designers and our director in front of the authentic painting which really spread a lot of debate with the audience We've had uh, collaborations with uh, Europeana Creative, um, where we uh, showed their culture cam, where you could search in Europeana's collections using your body gestures, the colors and patterns on your clothes. Uh, we had that installation at the museum. We also did a remix exhibition a couple of years ago asking uh, artists and designers to remix public domain artworks and exhibit their remix next to the originals. So again, this bridge between digital, physical, enlightenment and experience. Here are some of the remixes. Just quickly, this Hamaswai painting, the original, and a nice pop-up, uh, like a pop-up book version of it. Uh, and again, we always try to bring people into the galleries and meet the artists and have conversations and exchanges with them. So we really try to bring, um, go from the digital data and back into uh, physical spaces, whether it be in the museum or outside. We've also played with Van Gogh yourself, uh, doing little workshops at the museum where people could dress up like a painting. A really fun time for good friends uh, families but also a great learning experience because when you try to analyze the composition of a painting and get into character you really get to know that painting well and it really spreads so this painting was also picked up by a popular BC radio host and got a lot of uh, traction on Facebook an example of outside uh, the museum walls uh, is a collaboration we did with the Copenhagen Metro Company, where we had uh, our young uh, art pilots do a remix, like a 70 meter long remix of artworks from our collection, together with the people living uh, in the uh, apartment buildings around this uh, construction site. Um, so really bringing art into the streets. Another example uh, done with our volunteer art pilots was actually um, in a, a drug injection room in central Copenhagen, um, where the art pilots worked again together with the users of this uh, place to remix um, and create wallpaper for these very sterile rooms where they inject their 
drugs and really turn the room into a whole new experience for the users who never come to uh, an art museum uh, and you know make a traditional visit to museums but here they can interact and feel ownership with the artworks in their own environment. The last example I have is again the art pilots at what we call the Young People's Meeting, which is a democracy festival for young people uh, taking place every year in Copenhagen. And here we did um, a very sort of um, uh, hands-on uh, collage workshop last year, uh, inviting young people to cut and paste uh, physically into prints of artworks from the collection and create collage. Uh, to explore what it feels like to express emotions uh, about difficult feelings uh, through images. And here are just a couple of statements from some of the attendants. It's easier for me to express my emotions through images or drawings because then I don't have to explain everything. And then other people can make their own sense of it and relate to it in their own way. And here are some of the other attendants. Uh, kids between 13 and 23, I guess. Um, it's like art changes character when you can touch it with your own hands. You're able to look at it up close. It means a lot to be able to hold the art between your hands and touch it. These are some of the impacts that we're trying to create through uh, radically opening up our collection and bringing it to people where they are uh, in meaningful ways. So again, um, we really don't want our digital um work to stay in the in the in the cloud um what we really want is to uh, build bridges between learning and um experience and uh, digital and physical there's a um, uh, an impact report about the um, the project we did at the young people's meeting if people are interested uh, at europeana pro and then I'm done with my short presentation and open for questions. Thank you very much, Marita. That was really interesting. And I already have a first question to you from the audience. Um, how do you inspire leadership and colleagues to support SMK's innovative work in this space? We've seen exponential and steady progress with the SMK over the years. Well, uh, one of the ways is uh, through having a person like me on, uh, on the staff, because uh, one of my tasks is to be an advisor in digital museum practice, not only here internally at the museum, but uh, also to colleagues in uh, Danish institutions, both in uh, museums, but also libraries and archives um, and beyond. Um, and also uh, the role I play um, in uh, various international uh, fora and networks. Uh, and I think that's one of the really brilliant things that SMK has um, done and sort of taken responsibility for, um, because we are um, the largest art museum in Denmark and we have this national gallery role. Um, and that brings about some specific responsibilities that other museums don't have uh, in our country. Um, and one of them is to really um, uh, you know, both be kind of um, uh, breaking the waves of new technologies and, and learning some of the hard lessons and then being able to share that. For instance, all the tech hype that we we really spend a lot of energy on that between 2008 and 12, just doing a lot of futile projects that never really, you know, they, they ended in the app graveyard and everything. But but we were then able to share our knowledge with colleagues. Um, and, um, you know, the fact that I'm kind of a specialist both in art history, but also now in, in digital practices. Um, so uh, the museum can sort of share me with um, the sector. <laughs>
and we're really happy about that. So um, I have another question to you because I really liked um, that you spoke a lot about where your digitized collections all um, take place. So they're all over the the town and all over the country. Um, and um, but what is the actual um, chance for you as an institution? Uh, could one ask? So why is that positive for the SMK? Well, if you remember uh, what I uh, quoted from um, our strategy, uh, we are obligated to be a museum for everyone in Denmark. But of course, not everyone will ever come to the physical gallery. Um, we have around 400,000 visitors a year. That's a fraction of the Danish population. And we also want to go beyond Denmark uh, as a national gallery. That's part of our DNA. Um, so uh, what we do... Uh, with this digital openness is really fulfilling our strategy on uh, so many levels um, and um, uh, helping us uh, be relevant for more and more diverse audiences. That's really great to hear. <laughs> um, thank you very much, Maretta. Um, we're now turning to uh, Cleveland. Um, hi, Jane. Hi. Um, and Larissa, thank you for having me be part of this. What like these are my idols speaking today, so it's really fun, um, especially since the uh, Cleveland Museum of Art um, just opened their collection last January. And um, after a lot of research of everything that's been going on with um, MK being one of the leaders, so thank you for inviting me today. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we create wonder through digitization at Cleveland. So um, I, I guess that I'll just say I, I am the Chief Digital Information Officer at the Cleveland Museum of Art. And the reason my title has both in it is because um, it's really important to us that our technology department and our digital departments are all one, so that we all work together so that we are building the actual physical infrastructure of the building, the um, back-end design of all how all our, our data and databases work together, and then creating outward experiences, be it in the museum or out and beyond. So I always like to start with this slide because this has been the mission of the museum um, since 2006, um, sorry, 1916 when it um, opened. Um, and the Click Museum of Art creates transformative experience through art for the benefit of all the people forever. And then we like to add bringing our mission into the digital age. And I feel very passionate about this mission, and it's why I have been here since 2010. I also like to show this slide because um, it's been, I mean, I think everybody knows uh, the hardest part of doing these digital experiences is really getting support from leadership. And um, that's um, my boss, um, uh, Bill Griswold, who, um, though he doesn't come from a sort of a, a digital um, proudness, he actually got here and realized the impact it was making. And every time we've had a new idea, he has actually um, helped me get it um, uh, so that we can begin. It doesn't mean that it doesn't stop with trying to work with everybody, but he has been a big supporter, and I think that's really important for museums to be able to do anything. Um, I like to show this picture sometimes because actually when you do have a new digital project, people, somebody always brings up this slide or talks about how um, digital takes away the credibility of art and um, and it's um, and, and actually, I was working in 2014 with um, Erin Coburn on a project in um, Isabella Gardner, trying to, because they had um, asked us to come to bring digitization to the museum. And back then, we had like had three days to work with the staff, and um, and we were really making some progress. And on our last day, the um, front page of the New York Times art section had this photo, and. <laughs> uh, thus we left with, <laughs> with them starting over, but they're doing some fun things now. Um, I also like to sh um, show this from um, a presentation that the form well, the former, former CDO, Shri, at the Met, um, and I think it's uh, really interesting because in 1967, in the minutes of the curator meeting, it says that Ms. Irma Wilkinson 
has questioned the effectiveness of a computer in the catalog department. And as we all know, the Met has reconsidered that statement. So, um, uh, and I also like to bring them up because they are also someone we looked about how they did open access. So anyway, I started in the museum in 2010. And um, when I came, we were in the middle of a building project and we were in the middle of, uh, I came and heard about this lifelong learning center that we had been given a donation to use technology and um, art and uh, digital to make um, the collection more accessible, um, take away the intimidation of an art museum, um, make it really part of everybody's life. Um, and I asked, well, how are we going to support the content? And they said, oh, well, we have, we're, you know, because of this building project, we're digitizing the whole collection and we have it organized in a way that's so amazing. And I was so excited and I came downstairs and this is what they showed me, all these gold DVDs of the, uh, collection that they were on the way to digitizing. So I realized we had a little bit more work than I thought, but I was really excited to see that digitizing the collection in a very conservative museum in 2010 was really, someone had really been forward thinking. And I give that um, shout out to our um, registrar's collection management team that really um, was started that. One of the processes was that since we had to take every piece of artwork off, off view, that you would digitize every object as it came off you, and then you would go back to working on all the things that have been in storage, and when you um, and all the new things that went back on view, they would then photograph it. Now we they kind of stopped that for multiple reasons, but I have gotten a especially with the open access collection, and we're in the middle of trying to be. Uh, I don't know if it's the first museum, but to say that we're 100% digitized, and when I say 100%, I mean every single record, so every part, um, every component, every top of the tea kettle would have its own record and it's digitized and we are um, hopefully, I'm, I'm saying by fall 2020, but it might be earlier, um, it all just depends. So that's exciting and that we also have a system in place because we are a collecting museum and we, are, we acquire objects every quarter that we will always be at 100%, that's our goal. This was the Lifelong Learner Center became Gallery One, which was the um, really intertwining of physical, digital, and um, uh, actual art and actual masterworks from our collection. Um, I like to show this original one because it was all about um, these sort of thematic groupings. Um, this is the part which we now call um, the Artlands Exhibition Area. It was a great start and it was all about using our collection and the wall Right here is what um, I think became known kind of throughout the world. I've seen multiple iterations, but what was really fantastic about the wall was not the micro tiles, was not the design, all which was fabulous, not that it um, connected, well now through Bluetooth, through your Android or your iPhone, but that you, it was live, that you can see um, objects from our collection, um, anything on view at all times. And then we have different scenes and. I'm sort of hitting myself because we do have a new theme called open access objects. So that comes up also. Um, and the other thing was the app, the same thing, every object on view, when it went on, I mean, when coming to the art museum, I had no idea that artwork moves every week, 200 objects, different galleries are reinstalled. And this actually at any time, every object, every single object on view is always findable. Um, and then has its object page. The big part of um, that is actually really exciting to the people that come and work on my team, but was not as sexy. I think it's getting a sexiness now, but was really looking at, we had the time, had 36 different types of databases, um, and uh, this is a sort of updated version that our new director of technology has done. Um, but we really looked since 2012, how are we going to relate all our different databases, all our front ends and all our internal systems so that we are always having one source of truth. And this is where we're currently at, and this is the talk in itself, but um, Ethan Holda would uh, be happy to share this and talk more about it. Um, but it had to be flexible and fully integrated to do the things we want to do. So um, 216, we began a new iteration of Artlands Gallery. We started with Artlands Studio, 
which we really want people to create and get a relationship with our collection. Then Artlands ex Exhibition, we decided to remove all the touch screens and take another barrier away, put the art first, um, and that we use multiple different types of games in that area from facial recognition to um, eye tracking to um, uh, all gesture based um, ways of connecting with the art so that you understand composition, purpose, um, symbolism, and um, the emotion and gesture of an object. And then, of course, our wall has really nothing. It's, it's scary, but it's, um, it's technically like seven and a half, actually almost eight years old because we in January of 2012. We began doing production on it and it opened the following December and we have really done nothing to it except that it refreshes constantly every 15 minutes with new information and new data. So um, as I said, um, without constant iterativeness, we would not be where we are. We are always look going from the front end to the back end to our software design. We are always making improvements so that we can spend the real fun and the real energy on solving the problem at hand and thinking about more ways that we can make our collection accessible to all because we truly do believe that art is a part of everyone's life and it's just about getting people to connect in to the way that they feel comfortable. So um, this is um, in the last two years, we have a whole new middleware for all of our outward facing, including our collection online. And I bring this up because this made the technical aspects of doing open access um, really fairly easy for us. Um, I would say, you know, 80% was working with legal um, and, you know, another 15% was working with parts of the uh, museum that had, you know, fears of open access. And um, I would say really 5% was the technical. And we decided if we were going to do technical, you know, we wanted our API to be um, um, easily searched. We wanted to use AI searchability. And we wanted it to be really a best practice so that other museums wouldn't have to start from scratch. They could just do what we, you know, they could see everything we did and be able to apply it to their systems. Um, the great thing, as I said, is that everything updates in every 15 minutes. So when there's a new photo, because as you know, we're in the middle of getting every object photographed. If there's a new something that goes on open access on January 1st, a whole new set of um, objects will go into the collection. But we wanted one source of truth, no matter what game you're playing, what app you're looking at, what if you're looking at our collection online, or if you're downloading, there is the same information. Um, I point out a couple of the other things we're doing with digital. We're using eye tracking to really get a sense of how people are looking at objects. And I know this, I, again, I'm a person that I want to make sure the technology is not a barrier and it's not interfering and it works really well. So one of the things that, um, why this is so exciting is it's really accurate. And, um, and it also only takes two seconds to calibrate your eyes. And then um, you can look at a picture for an uh, image for 15 seconds and it will show exactly where you went. Um, we also are doing things showing that you don't have to like art to have a connection. And there's this thing you'll look at artwork like 30 seconds, you look at different artworks and then it will give you a, a sort of you can pick one that will give you a way to go into the gallery to um, look at it a different way. And um, we're sort of playing with different ideas there. Um, and the other thing is about really the visitors being part of this, no matter what game you're doing or what you're playing, that it shows up sort of on the, um, the intro screen that is really just letting people know what Artlands Gallery is, what's going on in there. And it's, again, constantly fresh with, what, with the latest people that are in there and what they're doing. And that's really important, what they're creating because we always want to let you know it's changing and it's updating all the time. So this is something someone asked me a while, why do educators and curators need to create involving digital spaces? And, um, and I like a big part, as we already know, is to show more. In our first iteration of Gallery One in 2012, all our objects would rotate um, and you would be able to look at it and see more. Um, and one of the things that I should note is all the objects in that space um, we rotate every 18 months, and the first iteration, as you can imagine, got, um, curators did not want to um, choose their favorite artworks to be in that space, but the director at the time said, if we're doing this, we need to have masterworks. The interesting thing is, 
objects in that space become the favorite objects of people coming to the museum and they move back into the galleries and now people are like finding these galleries they've never found before because they're looking for the emerald um, Mughal pendant that was in the gallery last time and that they fell in love with in you know the purpose game. Um, the other thing is relating physical to digital. Merit talk about this a little bit, but it's really important. And you see an object, you'll see it projected. You then will go and play a game that talks about um, either the, the symbolism or the, you can feel, you'll make a pose and feel the stress that um, Apollo is feeling. But it's then, it gives you the sense that you want to go back and look at it again. And then the other thing is playing with scale. So at, at, I love digital, that you can make it big. You can, we have a wall, a zoom wall, which I'm not showing in this space, where your body can zoom into any image. Um, and that's great. But the other thing is at the end of every single game, we actually show the actual size, be it if it's a lot larger or a lot smaller, you get a context of what you're looking for in the gallery. Again, because it's important to us that um, digital brings you into the collection. And the other thing is, is the way we've done our back-end systems and what we're doing, we're able to think outside. We don't even know what the next project can be, but like this is, you know, the original label that people see next to art collections. And now because every single thing we do for all our interactives, it's mapped in our back-end system. So the, the ability and the information we have on every object now, you know, questions like what is the new label you know when i've heard people talk about digital labels and a lot of times it just becomes sort of a, a a label on an ipad but this is a whole new way like what is a label and what could it be with all this content and digital information we have about the object um the other thing that was really fun this summer I, I, it's like time to, is that well we added photogrammetry so now um which is also in our online collection um, you can now um, investigate before you play a game. You can look at an object. This is our Wade cup, which is a really tiny cup, but it's beautiful and it has all this um, zodiacs and inscriptions on it. And you can just explore it using your hand, as you see there. Um, the other thing was that we, we, we loved that our phone could scan throughout the museum, but we originally didn't have 3D because, again, if it doesn't work really, really well, I usually take it out of the scope. We now have 3D scanning available, which is awesome. And the other thing is that you can connect your phone to any single game, and it goes, um, no matter Android or, or iOS, it goes right to your photo um, area so that you don't need to be you can take photos of yourself but it will you can we get we want to remove the barrier of you not like interacting with the game and at the end if you're playing something that takes a photo it goes right to your phone oh and there's the wake cup right there um is that we've always from the beginning um been collecting analytics um for at the very beginning as you favorited something on the wall or in the app it would show up um, we collected everything we share, we analyzed the best we can, but we really weren't getting good um, data. And then um, there was a talk on this last year in that um, we had a grant and our evaluation team worked with um, Rockman and they did this amazing study that really gave us some insights like never before. And one of the really, um, uh, we found out that 36% of the participants spent time in Artland's gallery who walked in the door. And that was what, about what we thought was right based on other types of analytics we were gathering. Um, but the other thing that was great that people self-reported that who had went into Artland's gallery, actually when they left, they reported a greater um, increase understanding and knowledge and this was done in a way that we didn't know if people were going to Artlands or not I mean the study it's on um, it's on our website I, I recommend reading it it's actually really interesting because it's a template for how you evaluate all digital but we really weren't understanding where people were going how long are they staying where do they go next so um, we used all the data we were collecting um, from our Meraki wireless access points and the thing that about that is, is that is a lot of big data. I mean, that is information about anyone who has a Fitbit or a phone. We don't know personally who it is, but we, we can see, um, we can attract um, through, you know, sort of um, where they're going, you know, where they're spending time, 
um, and the patterns, you know, how they came in and how they left. Uh, there were some challenges with this. There's a lot of noisy data. We had to translate devices to visitors because, you know, how, you know, someone with a Fitbit and an iPhone and an iPad, you know, that's not three people, that's one person. Um, and so we also had to look at other evaluations to build trust. Um, and so we were able to do that when we had a big Kusama exhibit because it had different patterns of people and it was able to sort of match up with what we were seeing. What we, what we did also is we brought a local data scientist uh, who um, had graduated from Case, our university next door, and his team came in and did some really fascinating things with us to interpret the data. So first they came up with this dashboard that was showing where the amount of people were, where they were spending the most time, and we were like, this is super cool. So I brought it to the executive team and they were like, we don't know what that means or any, it's not, you know, like they all kind of look sort of like so. So then um, I, this is like a pattern and it shows how people are moving throughout the museum and where they're going and you can look at different times of day. And I showed that to them and they were like, uh, we don't, we still don't understand how to use this. Uh, we then start to make some real insights and looked and worked with the uh, data scientists and um, visitors who did not visit Artland spent 2.2 hours at an average in the museum, which we had already kind of known from other things, but this was good. It also built trust. And they went to a few spaces overall. We did find that visitors who visited Artland um, spent um, and were under five minutes spent about 12 minutes longer and they did seem to visit more spaces. But the amazing thing is visitors who spent at over five minutes in Artlands, um, it was, they spent between 36 minutes and an hour more at the museum. They went to more galleries and they actually seemed to like to spend money at the cafe, which is all really interesting and let us know that actually it was really doing what we wanted it to do, it was encouraging people to get into the gallery. So this was huge to us and it was the beginning of realizing that all this use of digital and data and the combining of physical and digital was really, you know, telling us things and we have now the ability to ask different types of questions like does the selection of artworks in Artland impact gallery visits. So we're starting to look at different areas from the art of the Americas, Chinese art, contemporary and seeing like what art people played with and then where are they going in the museum and that can that help like encourage people to go into different areas of the museum that um you know aren't is you know the favorite gallery is our um, impressionist gallery but we have one of the top asian collections in the world so maybe it can encourage people to try something new so um that's all in the middle of what we're trying to do but of course we're always continuing to iterate this all comes back to, though, um, this back end allowed us to sort of experiment with these things, to overlap these things, and the new API allowed us to implement open access. I'm going to show a quick video.
With our launch of um, open access last year, it was really important that we launched with partners that could show um, what you what's possible within open access collection. And we wanted to do it on day one so that people would immediately start using our collection. Um, and uh, it was important that it was all different levels also, that there were businesses, there was education. Um, and so, uh, the when we launched a month before we launched, we actually contacted people thinking, oh, there's not going to be enough time. But um, we allowed people to preview our API and preview our um, AI search. And they so many people were so excited about it that um, and that we were actually giving our metadata with it, which made it a really beautiful um, data set to a lot of data scientists. So, um, and I'm just showing this slide because it was so interesting to me that the people that were most worried about scholarship were the worries, that they worried the most that we were going to give our digital didactic over to CCO and that our provenance and um, the citations and et cetera. And all these, all these fields, if they're filled out in our database, they are available um, through CCO with every image. And the great thing about this is for the last eight years, I have not gone a lot of, um, our curators have lots of exhibitions, they're always doing catalogs and research, and we weren't making a lot of movement on our database um, for our collection management system. And it is amazing because so many people are looking at our collection and asking questions. The amount of people that are adding to the data is, is, on, a, is on a daily app. And it's great that we update every 15 minutes because every there's always new data added to the collection. I use this slide um, sort of like the map, but it's, we found that it's true. Um, this is one of our famous um, this, um, stargazer and you know museums don't have the resources and by being part of Wikidata it can be translated into 29 languages and it is and that's really exciting to us because that would not otherwise happen. Since launch um, we in September opened a new um, search the collection. We looked at everybody's collection so if you have a museum with a, a collection we looked at it and we found a lot of things that was Interesting. It's really hard to get to an object quickly in a museum website, we found out. They like to put a lot of stuff before you get there. And that was one of the things we decided that we wanted to quickly get people into the collection. And then we wanted a way that it was like how people are thinking about Google. Every single field is just like you would do Google and it has things that it recommends. Um, and we um, have, are constantly working on it, but we're very proud of our search page because, again, it's all about getting to the collection. And because of our back end, we're able to do things. This just came up this week as we have some um, visitors suggested. Um, so we're able to show, I mean, um, uh, you know, female artists, African artists, but this is like made before the, you know, artists that were made before the age of 30. Um, and different things like that. It's just actually what a visitor thinks about, we can actually help put out there for people to again get to the collection. Um, all of this is because open access, we have on every object page, you know, easy ways to contact us and we get lots of stuff every day with people giving us new information about the collection. Sometimes it's really helpful, things that people haven't noticed, it's new information, sometimes it's not so helpful, but it's like activating the collection. Thus, it's activating the people in the museum, adding to the collection on a daily basis. And um, the other big thing was, yes, we said let's. Op not only did we never have our provenance on site online, we now are saying it's available through CCO. Um, this is big to me. It was really important that every single object page. Um, let you know what you could do, that you can download it. As it said in the video, we offer high-res TIFFs and we offer JPEGs and we, you know, we offer it all. Again, we don't want to consider, we want you to be able to use it for whatever way you want, but I point out this is that we're under CCO, Creative Commons Zero, um, or I always say, oh, it's zero, <laughs> Creative Commons Zero, and it was really important that we were really clear. You can copy, modify, distribute this work even for commercial purposes. I had a fight for that little line right there, even though initially, and then when you click on it, we'll take you to the Creative Commons page. But that little line has made people feel, yes, they are transparent and they're actually using our collection again for a lot more things than they have in the past. And actually we've gotten um, from um, different 
publishers who said, you know, this is a great, we're going to use this collection for the cover of the book. Two different cases. Um, I like to bring up Andres, um, who made Bot, he's Mr. Bot guy. I know you guys probably all know him, but he's done every department and our fun facts. And I have to say, I myself follow um, and I see objects that I didn't even realize were in the collection. So it's really fun to do that. Um, uh, Case Western Reserve University has created a whole new class. It's about coding your own game. And in this class, you come and from the beginning, you learn how to use tools like Illustrator and Photoshop. You learn how to code. You learn how to build a game. And they all ha have to create a game. And the rule is you must use Cleveland Museum of Arts open access in your game. And it's, there's about 15 of them, and I'll put those online if people want to check them out, but super fun and, again, really great way to um, see, see how people are using the collection. Um, last year when we first opened, someone heard we were opening, and they immediately got their class um, to do coding, and they were in the middle of a project, an actual game class, a gaming class, and they just said you need to use the um, the open access and this was like sort of the first iteration of they did put our collection in their game. Um, this was just recently um, and it's really fun to see. This is a really one of the top favorite Cupid and Psyche images in our collection and it was on the Dolce and Gabbana runway and what we like to get at it again is that it doesn't matter how you're using it, who you're using it, if you're inspired by it, we're happy. Um, and then um, in Texas they had this whole um, Using uh, they liked our API and this came from I did a talk to NASA and they were sent, and they saw our, our data set and then they um, actually led this um, different results and really focused on um, predominant colors in our prints and it was pretty interesting to look at that. I bring up the analytics again because we're working on dashboards. We're really trying to understand analytics for years. Everyone always talks about data, everyone talks about analytics, but we're, we're trying to say, like, how can we really show impact? How can we show that this, that open access collections does drive people to sort of understand the collection more, to come to the museum even more? Um, to There was a question on Twitter last week about, um, are people seeing more scholarship use? And so how can we really show that, I mean, we, we have anecdotal, but we want to use data. So. Um, uh, we, we're part of multiple repositories now, our entire collection. We update the, and it, because of the API, it updates, you know, quarterly. Um, and we just, again, looked at this in which on our website, one of the most famous, our Claude Monet, our water lilies, that's um, probably the biggest favorite painting in the collection, and it gets 200,000. Um, an image that's not so known in our collection is at 2 million. Um, the other thing that was interesting, we looked at the top 10 artworks on our collection online. Nothing in these objects was, you know, we, we know these, these are, we can, we see these all the time pretty much. Um, but then on Wikipedia, it was really interesting to see, wait, these are the top 10 and they're completely different. And it let us know our collection was being used in a whole new way that we might never have even thought about. Um, we looked at different, um, between Wikimedia page views versus collection online and decorative arts is not even gets a number on our uh, website, but in Wikimedia, it's one of the top things people look at. Think Egyptian, the difference. Um, and so all of that's been super uh, exciting and we're, it's always ongoing. I never, it's like I always come to the end and the end is like we're working on lots of different ways to kind of keep understanding, keep um, creating new tool sets so that when there's a new problem or some new idea, we're able to um, sort of create, we don't have to spend a lot of time of how we're going to do it. We're able to really think about what is it. And sort of our future is like working with other museums that do open access that are tech savvy to sort of build a community to share the collections in new and unique ways. So um, thank you again for today. And um, and uh, oh, I always like to show our director. We did have on our open access day where we had literally a literal fanfare. Um, we then had all the different um, uh, partners that um, created things come, and there's our director uh, using a HoloLens and looking at a gallery virtually with um, that that changes every 30 seconds. So thank you again, and uh, any questions?
Um, so there's uh, some questions in the chat. Thank you very much, Jane. That was really exciting. Um, can you speak to the importance of analytics and business intelligence for digital and open access? How does the evidence of impact you capture in data directly guide your customer experience approaches? We're still learning that. That's why we're, as I said, we're doing lots of things and trying to then see what we can find. But um, one thing that was interesting, as I said, we had um, Kusama exhibit here, which was um, a huge exhibit that brought people in that hadn't come to our museum before. But it was a series of seven different um, uh, different um, uh, designed booths, and um, you would have to wait online, and you would be in these 15 minute um, intervals of your ticket. And so it was great because it started upstairs and went downstairs. And then it was our main gallery and it continued on to our secondary gallery. So we were able to sort of verify, okay, wow, the atrium that never has people like in it in 15 minutes, we, we were seeing everything that we knew was happening. But the other thing that we realized by coincidence was um, and it was super, I mean, we were sold out the second we, you know, would bring tickets up every Monday and people came multiple, you know, could try to come multiple times and they could get tickets. They went to the, um, we figured, we realized that 25% of the audience did not go to the second gallery downstairs. And it wasn't that you couldn't see it, but it, like it, we were starting to realize like, are people getting fatigue or is the, is the middle in the, is the part in the middle, does it look like they're just going to do the same thing? Um, and it gave an opportunity to say, if we made the elevator, I mean, the escalator go down the other way, would people actually go to both sides? Um, but it was, it was the beginning of showing data to other places that other than um, just the digital department on how can visitor services and exhibitions change things using the data and do some A-B testing. Great. Um, and we have another question. Are there any privacy infringement aspects associated when tracking visitors? That's a great question. So we don't track visitors. We track devices. There is no way, and it's all encrypted. Um, there is a notification that, you know, there's Meraki endpoints that collect it. We, it, the data is so big that we actually have to kind of say like two, I think it's 2.3 um, endpoints equals a person. We can see, you know, um, we can then see like the first five places, you know, this device went and left. We can tell that if a device is in a gallery for eight hours, they're probably a guard. We can, you know, clear all that out. But there isn't any, you know, we we put legally, there's there's no infringement. We let people know we're doing it. If you have your phone in airplane mode, you know, you you can, not be tracked but you're not individually tracked it's um, just tracking where devices are and they're not personalized in any way and nor is there a way to find out nor is the data i mean i guess you could but the data is so big that is not the level we're looking at it to understand patterns of where people are going and where they're not going so that we can make better decisions as a museum to improve the visitor experience started out as, oh, here's a way to see if people are actually going in the gallery from Art Lens for me, because we had all these Meraki endpoints. But, um, and uh, we, we, um, and we do have a little talk on that, that, um, uh, uh, that I can also share about the privacy and all the things we, we clarify so that people understand really what's legally, you know, fine and that people don't feel um, that, that their, their privacy is being taken away. Thank you very much. Then um, maybe I have a last question. So um, you talked about that you opened up and that you decided to go open access. Um, and how did you, this change your institution's relationship to um, those outside of the museum who are trying to reuse your data? Well, actually, it's, it's amazing because a lot of those partners you saw that said, oh, yeah, we'll try something with it because we said we'll, we'll, we'll put you as part of our launch day. And, it's a way to to not only show off Cleveland, but show off what's going on in the rest of the world. But um, like American Greetings, for example, which that was probably, um, uh, if I didn't have a very close friend there, 
it was so interesting. Their lawyer kept saying, but what's the catch? Like their lawyer did not believe you could do whatever you want. Yes, you can make your own cards. So anyway, <laughs> um, but it, it was like, it took forever for them to pull because they just kept not understanding that, you know, I was like, you can put our name on the back. That'd be great, but you don't need to, you know, do what you want. So since then they have every year a, um, a, uh, they have to get all their designers like re-motivated because you know you get in a rut and they do a whole day where they just do all these different things with innovation design. They decided for their last one that they would only use the open access collection, which has brought all these people in Northeast Ohio who never who never really saw our collection. And actually, I went over for the morning of that, and it was amazing seeing because they have all the equipment to print it out in different levels. It was. That you know, so that that's a way that they're using our collection now, like you know, and getting it out there in other ways. Um, it's also, as I said, you know, a Case Western made a whole class, um, and I saw Neil said to post the syllabus, so I will get that syllabus, and we will post that syllabus, um, which I didn't even know existed. They invited me over to do a talk at the library, and this other this professor gave his talk, and I was like, wait, can I have that? That's amazing, you know. <laughs> um, and, but he does make them give credit that they have a whole credit page on their games and that, that was interesting also. Um, so it's, it's gotten people to know, I mean, Dolce but Gabbana made a dress that was on, you know, Italy runway. I mean, our collection is getting out there. People are making access. And the one thing is that being in Cleveland, we are known as one of the top encyclopedic collections, but the world doesn't really know it. Scholars know it, but the world doesn't know it. And Every time someone comes to our museum, they're like, wow, the question that's asked is, is that the real one? Which is, you know, ridiculous, but actually people have no idea and people are beginning to really know that this collection is, you know, worth looking at. And by giving ease, by giving tool sets that are easy to use, and by the way, anytime a developer writes something, um, we might tweak our, our API if we didn't realize or think about something that wasn't available. And we do look at, like, every time someone opens their other API, we look at what they've done and we're realizing, wow, no, you should look at ours because ours is really about getting what you need in the way you need it. And, um, and we want more people to do that so that we can figure out something that we can do all together. Thank you very much, Jane. That was amazing to hear from you. Thank you very much to Cleveland. We're now turning back to Sweden and it's Aron Ambrosiani um, from the Nordic Museum next up on our virtual stage. So um, welcome Aron um, and um, we're happy to listen to you. Thank you uh, and hi everyone. And uh, first off, uh, thanks to Maretta and Jane for presenting. If you get a chance to visit Cleveland Museum of Art, do it. It's an amazing experience. Not the least uh, the um, Artlands Gallery, of course. So I'm going to talk a bit about creative reuse as well, since that is today's topic. But uh, that can also mean something different, I think, when you are working at a cultural history museum, as compared to the art museums we've listened to so far. Uh, the Nordic Museum looks like this. It's in uh, Stockholm, Sweden, and uh, we have a large collection of objects uh, and other material uh, looking at Swedish and Nordic history for the last 500 years. Altogether, there are about 1.5 million artifacts. Um, we think around 6 million photographs, uh, although no one has counted them all. Um, and in addition to uh, that type of collecting there are also uh, a library with several multiple volumes uh, a research library on ethnology cultural history and so on and uh, a publishing house that has been publishing uh, research and more popular uh, uh, books for the last 100 to 150 years we make uh, four different kinds of material available online in various uh, stages of open access uh, and 
uh, you will recognize most of this, of course, collections metadata, uh, collections images, when we have them, publications, when we can put them online. And we are looking more and more at uh, publishing archival material as well, not only the registered register or metadata of the archival material, but actually adding lots of scanned documents and making them available for reuse. This is a sketch of how our material is di distributed. Most of it, I, I'm kind of jealous when I see the percentages of uh, other institutions like Cleveland. Um, we, of our photos, for instance, I think we are past 2% digitized now, but it's uh, still a long way to go. Uh, so most of it is not digitized. You have to come here to Stockholm, to Sweden, and uh, explore the archive yourself. Uh, some of it is digitized, and most of those records are published online uh, at digitaltmuseum.org.se and are thus available to look at. Our licensing policies are moving towards open access but not uh, like everything at the same time, which means that part of what is available online is also available for reuse. And I think that's a common situation for lots of museums. And you could, if those of you that have uh, been following this webinar series could see kind of aggregated stats being presented by Douglas McCarthy last time, I think. Um, so we are in that situation. We have been able to make some stuff available uh, all the way to uh, a free license for open reuse, but not everything. So basically we are uh, trying to move things upwards in this um, uh, scale of, culture, of, of uh, creative commons licenses. Uh, and once you reach the top, uh, the, have the, the dark green ones, uh, a work can be considered a free cultural work, which is approved for open access or uh, open reuse. Um, I think one thing is worth mentioning here, which also is kind of a different situation than uh, some of the other presenters previously, uh, not only today, but also uh, in the previous webinars. Uh, in our collections at the Nordic Museum, uh, in addition to uh, public domain works where we can decide until the, the EU law changes and everyone is required to, now we can decide to share a public domain work without putting our own license on the digitized copy. Um, but we also have a lot of works in our collections where it's actually the Nordic Museum that is the copyright holder, since the museum for a long time has been collecting uh, both as donations and as uh, uh, and uh, uh, accession in other ways. Uh, we have collected a large collection of uh, cultural historical photographs, where lots of them are still uh, copyrighted. Um, at least depending on how you view Swedish copyright laws. Um, so there are lots of copyrighted material where the economic rights are owned by the Nordic Museum, but we still want to share them. Uh, so that's kind of a different situation than sharing public domain works, because these works are not in the public domain. They are owned by the Nordic Museum, and then we decide to share them using Creative Commons licenses. So how can we help people reuse uh, whatever we manage to make available in an open license. To begin with, this is the situation. Some people just, and, and this is basically the same thing that Meretta said in her talk. Some people visit our building, uh, um, several hundred thousands every year, but those will always be a minority of Swedish population and uh, not in the least a minority of the world population. So we try to cast a wider net with our, our uh, content. We make it available on Digitalt Museum, which is a shared uh, online collection for Swedish and Norwegian museums. 
which is uh, included in the collections management system we use. Uh, and that has a wider reach than the amount number of physical visitors. We make material available on Wikimedia Commons, uh, which is bigger yet. And of course, the rest of the internet or the rest of the world is a lot greater. Free access metadata and images uh, are made available on Digitalt Museum. So these are the images where we still have not been able to clear the rights to make them truly open access. These are shared with copyright, with unknown licenses where we can't determine the, the copyright holder. We, we believe that an image is in copyright, but we don't know who owns the copyright, for instance. Um, so those cannot be shared on Wikimedia Commons, for instance, but we can still display them until uh, something else is decided. Um, images in our own collections where we partly own economic rights, but they are shared with the original photographer, for instance. Those we can make available, but we cannot share them uh, in, uh, share them secondarily. Um, free cultural works where it's possible to license them with CC BY or, uh, or uh, more free than that. Those we can also make available in Wik Wikimedia Commons. Um, of the publications that have been published at the museum, uh, we are looking through those and determining which ones are uh, have uh, joined the public domain after their authors have been dead for 70 years. So those publications we are now making available on Wikimedia Commons and Wikisource as well. This is a lot of early research on the Swedish cultural history, for instance, not only Swedish, but other Nordic countries and Northern Europe. Um, so we can make the entire articles with transcriptions available. We can get help from the Wikimedia community to proofread our OCR uh, character, our uh, automated OCR, for instance. And not in the least, at the bottom we have open knowledge. What can happen with the source materials and with the research library at the museum? Um, when using Wikipedia. The information that is uh, entered into Wikipedia is done so with the CC by SA license, which means that it's shared freely uh, using open access and other people can re reuse the content. Um, I'm going to give you two examples. One of an image and show what happens when we make images available online, and then a more in-depth example on uh, how we try to encourage new articles being written on Wikipedia. Um, this is an image in the Nordic Museum uh, photographic archive, and it's not even our image to start with. It's a copy from the library of the Swedish parliament, but they haven't put it online. So the repro copy in the Nordic Museum archive has been digitized and is available online. Um, and it's old enough so that it's in, pub in the public domain. And it's a photo from a women's suffrage um, march in Gothenburg in 1918, uh, which is shortly before women's suffrage was uh, approved in Sweden. Um, this image has been available on Wikimedia Commons for a couple of years now, I think since 2011. Um, and what happens when you put something with historical value on Wikimedia Commons? It gets used. Uh, this this uh, list is actually, I think, two years old now. So there might be even more uses since then. Um, and once something is used widely on Wikipedia, that means that everyone else looking for images will find it and reuse it. Uh, so here are just some examples on how that image ends up on, in other places. 
on a website about democracy turning 100 years old in Sweden. It's the banner image, so it's like shown on every page on that website. Uh, when a university writes a press release, they use this image. Uh, when a, an author writes a book about the year 1918, the image appears on the cover. Uh, when one of the major newspapers writes a debate um, about uh, the International Women's Day, the picture appears. Use writing a photo, Wikipedia Commons. So not 100% correct, but at least people get to see the content. Uh, so th those are just some examples of how one image that made it all the way to Wikimedia Commons and into Wikipedia, because I think that's where people find it, not on Commons itself, how that image gets widely reused in multiple different contexts, which of course is really nice. But we can also kind of encourage and facilitate this ourselves. This photo is from the museum archive and library where uh, high school students doing their 12th year in Swedish school are writing what is called a diploma project before they leave uh, the high school and move on to working or uh, university studies they need to make one uh, diploma project and this is a kind of uh, a work where they get to try out what it's like to write a research essay for the university and we invite them to the museum to the library and to the archive uh, of the nordic museum and together we figure out how can they write this and publish whatever they write on swedish language wikipedia um, we look for the cross section here something a subject or uh, a theme that is mainly either entirely or mostly missing on swedish language wikipedia so there's a like a gap to fill there is research material available in the Nordic Museum, in our library. There might be archive material, there might be an exhibition. But most importantly, it's interesting to the student. Uh, because that's when they actually want to write about it. And that's when they will do a good job. So if we find that sweet spot in the middle, it usually turns out really well. Um, the students visit us multiple times, six uh, five or six times from September to March during their last year in high school. Uh, so they return to the library, they get to know the space, they find their favorite spots um, and go through these uh, stages to select first broadly and then more specifically what they want to uh, write about. And using our library, they find the relevant research and they are instructed by us and by uh, Wikimedia Sweden uh, volunteers and staff. They get to know how to edit on Wikipedia, how to analyze existing articles, look who did uh, write which parts of these and so on. Um, they get an introduction to Creative Commons licenses on how to um, uh, find photos that are suitable to use. They write the articles and then they publish and celebrate. Um, we've been running this program in a small scale for three years. We are doing the fourth round uh, at this moment. They are coming to visit us next week again um, to look at uh, archive photos. Um, and the results so far in, during these three years have been six participating schools with more than 50 students altogether. Uh, they've added and expanded a bunch of articles on Swedish language Wikipedia, um, uploaded several images from not only from our collections, but from other museum or archive collections as well. We don't force them to choose Nordic museum material. And they've written about 355,000 words, oh no, sorry, no, 355,000 uh, letters 
including uh, source uh, references and uh, those kind of things um, on Swedish language Wikipedia. These articles uh, have been visited over more than 200,000 times, uh, which is not what these students are used to when they're writing essays. Usually it's their teacher, maybe their parents or some uh, other student is forced to read it as well. But what they write in this project is actually used. It's on the internet, it's on Wikipedia. Everyone uses Wikipedia, whether they admit it or not. So these articles are actually being used. And that's something also that encourages these students to do a good job. Um, so for, for us, not being uh, an art museum, we do have some art in the collections, but for us reuse is not so much about the artistic or creative reuse in that sense, but reusing our materials or the materials in our collections rather, reusing that to create new knowledge. Um, and not only in the scholarly sense, but in a, in a wider participatory sense, uh, where uh, people on multiple levels of, uh, in, uh, or stages in their life can use the material to learn something and also share that on to other people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aaron. That's, that was really interesting. And I think it must have been amazing for the students to um, experience this kind of outreach with what they create. Um, I have um, a question in the chat. Um, do you extend the invitation to schools from like far away, like not in Stockholm, but for example, in other parts of Sweden? So far, the, the schools have been from different places in Sweden. Uh, we haven't been able to fund the travel, but uh, if the school can afford to send students to uh, the, to uh, Stockholm for some of these visits, uh, two or three of them, the rest of them we have done online. Uh, so we have had participating schools from uh, some other uh, cities in Sweden, as not, not as far north as Kiruna, but that would be uh, wonderful, of course. Um, I think it was really interesting that you mentioned that um, because of your collections being different than, for example, um, art museums, um, you also create other things with reuse. And I think it was really interesting um, that you mentioned that you create new knowledge together with those students. Um, do you also see um, that you help those students establish new competencies in using, um, so in um, navigating the web, for example, or using online sources? Uh, definitely, I think uh, we can. The part we play is that we help them understand Wikipedia in particular. But I think some things you learn while figuring out how Wikipedia works can be applied to lots of other publications as well. Although, like Wikipedia is is extreme in the sense that so many and so anonymous people can edit the content. Um, so some of the lessons learned are, are very specific to Wikipedia, but I think in an overall sense, they, um, they hopefully get the feeling that no, uh, like no encyclopedic entry or no finished educational or, or research text is purely neutral. There's always someone who has been trying to, uh, put it together and they have various limitations or access to various sources and uh, uh, they get to try that journey themselves by finding the research, trying to put it together and trying to, uh, um, trying to express that in a short and concise way for anyone else to read. 
Thank you very much to everyone. Um, this was a great session and we have had so many um, amazing examples of creative reuse from um, focusing on outside reuse. So um, what can, how can we take our digitized collections to the world outside of the museum building? What can we do with our digi digital data in our own exhibitions? And uh, how can we help others um, reuse our collections? Um, I hope you had a nice session with us and um, I wish you a nice evening. Thank you very much. Bye.